So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this uh, first of the uh, Institute for Quantitative Biomedicine uh, IQB seminars for the fall of 2022. Uh, apologies that uh, we were not able to start last week as planned. Uh, our uh, speaker had a death in the family that uh, necessitated his, uh, his rescheduling. Uh, so as, uh, as shown uh, above, um, uh, Squire Booker will, will be speaking on October the 11th, 2023. And um, uh, we are fortunate today to, uh, to have uh, Dr. Uh, Irina Sorokina um, from uh, Strenic LLC and previously from uh, the NIH. And uh, she'll be introduced by uh, uh, our colleague and, and friend, uh, Paul Falkowski. So before I, before I start, I just wanted to uh, go on record as saying that the, uh, the Institute for Quantitative Biomedicine here at Rutgers U University is committed to inclusion, diversity, equity, and access, uh, which means that we are working to recruit, retain, and develop diverse community of faculty, students, and staff through targeted online activities and in-person events. We are promoting inclusive scholarship and teaching. We are defining substantive and sustainable community engagement focused on internal activities as well as community events. We're building the capacity of our leaders to create inclusive climates and publicly recognizing strong leadership. And finally, developing institutional infrastructure to drive change by bringing the IQB community into planning and action. We have a, um, an inclusion, diversity, equity, and access committee uh, here at the IQB, which is ably chaired by Professor Wei Dai. Uh, and uh, other members of the committee include myself, Sagar Kare, uh, Michelle uh, Sangera, and uh, Christine Zardecki. If you'd like to learn more about these activities uh, and or join the committee, please uh, see this link on the iqb.rutgers.edu website, which will tell you more about uh, uh, activities that, uh, that are underway. Uh, as part of this initiative, we have established an IQB Inclusive Leadership Award, which honors members of our community whose achievements in IDEA, inclusion, diversity, equity, and access display a high level of excellence. Uh, the um, uh, 2022 awardee is uh, the graduate student Elizabeth Rosenzweig. Uh, we seek uh, applicants, uh, nominations um, from IQB members, including graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, research scientists, and faculty uh, by October 31 of this year for the, uh, the 2023 award. Uh, the instructions for um, applications and nominations are provided here, and uh, you should submit by email to Michelle Sangera at the, at the email address shown here. And you can also find the same information on the, uh, on the IQB website. The RCSB Protein Data Bank continues to be the beneficiary of uh, increased uh, federal funding. Uh, we recently received an $800,000 uh, supplement to our NIH grant, uh, which was awarded before just before the end of the federal fiscal year. <clears throat> we have uh, open positions for a senior front end developer at Rutgers, a scientific uh, bioinformatics software developer at Rutgers, another scientific software developer and scientific software developers at both UCSD and Rutgers, and also postdoctoral researchers at UCSD and, uh, and Rutgers. And uh, finally, uh, we um, are encouraging uh, applications from undergraduate summer research interns and uh, gap year interns uh, for those of you who are interested in software development, having come from uh, computer science backgrounds with an interest in, uh, in biology. Uh, I also want to bring your, you um, to your notice this uh, announcement for the second of uh, what will be a total of three IQB crash courses that will be offered this semester. The um, November 10th uh, crash course will be conducted in collaboration with the DOE knowledge base, otherwise known as KBase, and we'll be focusing on using KBase to access PDB structures and computed structure models from artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning uh, with a particular focus on the plant molecular biology community. The, uh, 
but uh, the, the skills that you'll learn in this crash course apply to any area of biology. The, uh, the center of this uh, lovely illustration uh, from uh, Maria Voigt, our graphic designer, is that of Arabidopsis thaliana, the hydrogen atom of uh, plant molecular biology. And I also want to draw uh, to the attention of both uh, senior undergraduates and uh, graduate students uh, to the 2023 10th Annual uh, Institute for Quantitative Biomedicine Winter Boot Camp, which will be focused on science communication. It's taking place uh, January 9th through 13th, 2023. And the, uh, uh, the lucky uh, participants will work intensively over the course of uh, five days with uh, one another and also experts in scientific writing and molecular visualization to develop a series of articles that will be published in the PDB 101 Molecule of the Month series, which is um, the centerpiece of our outreach and education activities here at RCSB Protein Data Bank. The, um, the URL is pdb101.rcsb.org. Uh, scholarships are available for top performing underrepresented minority students coming from outside Rutgers. Applications are due by email on the 31st of uh, October. Uh, of this year, and you can find the um, details of the boot camp and application instructions at uh, at this link on the um, uh, on our iqb.rutgers.edu website. Uh, our focus this year will be on uh, cancer drugs and uh, cancer cancer drug targets and uh, drugs used to treat cancers. Um, so there'll be an opportunity to uh, to learn about an area of medicine uh, as well as to hone your skills as a science communicator. Uh, I also uh, want to begin this, um, uh, this, this seminar series with an acknowledgement of the, uh, the team here at the Institute for Quantitative Biomedicine. Uh, these are familiar faces uh, to all of you, I hope, uh, on the Institute team, and then myself and uh, Sagar Kare, who's the head of the graduate program. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, turn the floor over to Professor Paul Falkowski, who will be introducing today's speaker. Paul, over to you. Thank you. Uh, can I get my video going? Uh, can I start my video? All right. Um, if not, not, not that important. Um, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce Irina Sorakina. Uh, Irina uh, got her uh, master's degree uh, at Moscow State University, uh, which is uh, one of the, the finest universities in, in Russia. Uh, she did this, uh, if I recall, because I do recall, because uh, my, uh, my brother and my uh, niece both went to Moscow State University that was in Soviet times, so it was a USSR. Then from 1988 to 91, she did her graduate degree in uh, chemical physics uh, and biophysics at the Russian Academy of Sciences. And she then moved to uh, United States in 1991. Uh, she was a technician in pharmacology at University of Kentucky. Uh, and she moved up into uh, various positions in uh, um, in academia, uh, she was in the Department of Protein Expression uh, at the Human Genome Sciences in 1995-96 uh, in Rockville, uh, Craig Venter World. Uh, and then um, she moved into uh, uh, private sector. And uh, she presently uh, is a founder of Strenic LLC in McLean, Virginia. And she's going to talk to us today about... Uh, protein folding, which is a, a hot topic, if you will. Um, and uh, I turn this now over to Irina. Um, can you see me? Can you hear me? Hello? Ah. Yes, we can. Okay. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, first of all, I wanted to say thank you for coming and thank you for invitation. And I hope um, you will be uh, uh, delighted and intrigued of what uh, in, in, in this area where 
um, thousands of people are working for uh, 50 years or even more, there is still something new uh, to do uh, after, after all. So young um, students, uh, young people, um, please be assured that um, you can uh, continue for many more <laughs> decades and, and protein folding problem uh, will give you a lot of delight and, and um, intellectual pleasure. Uh, with this, I wanted to uh, say that uh, I have two versions of uh, my talk. One is more formal and one is more personal. And um, today, I, I think I'll choose to, to present a more per personal one. And I will tell a little bit of my um, uh, personal observations and uh, experience over all these years. And one of the reasons is it's not just to, to tell <laughs> how, how difficult it was to work with proteins, but to uh, show that there is um, a bias of what is published, what is not. And uh, a lot of time, uh, failed experiments uh, and failed, um, failed um, work is not being published. So all we see is survivor bias. Um, all this protein folded, so let's let's publish it. And that another ten proteins didn't fold. Um, oh well, we didn't do it right, or we we didn't find the good conditions, or something happened along the way. So I will tell you some of the stories from trenches, uh, just to illustrate why we need to um, uh, answer. Um, um, very important question is are proteins um, folding by themselves or are they being folded by cell machinery and um, before I start presentation I'll add a little bit to, to uh, what uh, Paul was um, kindly saying about uh, uh, my career um, I um, I was born in Ukraine and um, was was raised there and I went to Moscow and at Moscow University, I was at the um, Department of Biochemistry, specifically in Zymology. So when we started, um, uh, my first experience was going to um, slaughterhouse, getting fresh uh, meat or um, bovine hearts, bringing it back to, to the lab, uh, putting on very warm clothes and working with, uh, with that material in the cold room for another two weeks. And side by side with the whole lab would do it big prep. Um, it required um, everybody's effort. And it was native proteins that we worked with. There were no cloning, no overexpression. It was proteins straight from animals. And cold room was important part of my life for many, many years um, after that. Uh, when we moved to United States, um, uh, I um, worked at various academic labs, but also at um, in, the, in, in industrial environments. Um, human genome sciences was a fledging um, pharmaceutical company, biotechnology company, but they wanted to be a pharmaceutical company, and they did um, a lot of um, um, protein expression, uh, high throughput uh, um, screening for proteins to, to use as pharmaceutical agents. And the proteins were mostly expressed at that time in bacteria and overexpressed. And there were a lot of insoluble um, proteins. And we uh, did solubilizations and guanidine and refolds. And uh, there were new protocols developed and there was production of um, large quantities of those proteins. And uh, years later, all of this activity stopped. Um, they closed the, the <laughs> overexpression in bacteria plant and they uh, switched to different methods of producing proteins. And there is a reason for that. And we'll talk about it later. Then um, I was following my husband's <laughs> career. It's a two body problem. And we went to California and I worked there at um, uh, Sequana Therapeutics and then at uh, Structural Genomics. Structural Genomics was a 
uh, high throughput crystallography company. And I started there when um, they were still assembling lab furniture. And in the first year um, of work, um, there were uh, people cloning, there were people purifying uh, proteins, uh, crystallographers growing crystals. So it was some um, division of, of um, functions. In uh, protein purification group, we had three people. In the first year, we had 5,000 proteins. And um, about 2,000 were purified, and about 500 were uh, good enough that um, to, for crystallography, and about 50 crystals were um, good enough quality for to take them to the beam, and uh, five structures came out out of this process. And again, they were insoluble proteins and. Uh, being uh, experienced in, in uh, refolding, I thought, oh, I'll, I'll do <laughs> the refolding of those pellets and see whether we can crystallize them. And um, we did not crystallize anything from those refolds. Um, ne my next, <laughs> next career um, change was uh, when I started you know, with all this experience, with thousands of proteins going through my hands, um, we moved to, to Kansas. My husband got a wonderful position at Stowers Institute for Medical Research. And I said, I will go to Kansas on one condition. I'll start my own lab. So he said, yes, do it. And I uh, bought a mass spectrometer and uh, chromatography equipment, rented space and, and set up uh, private um, protein expression, purification, identification by mass spectrometry lab. And for the next eight years, I made living purifying proteins, uh, identifying proteins, and especially interacting with hundreds and hundreds of uh, people uh, who would tell me about their projects, what they're doing, what is working, what is not working. So in the end, it was a um, uh, very unique experience. Who, who, who would have first-hand experience with so many real-life <laughs> protein preps? Um, when I retired um, after many years of uh, working too hard, I thought I need to, to think about what, what was it all about, all these years of working, what, what can I um, get out of it? And um, the result of, of, uh, of that contemplation, um, I will be presenting in my present current talk. So um, I need to start sharing screen and I want to make sure that um, you can hear me and that you can- We, we can hear you just fine, Irina. Great, share. And your screen sharing is working. And play. And, um, and you're good. You're, you're good. To, you're good to go. Yes. So again, the presentation is uh, uh, named "Do proteins fold or are they being folded?" And um, the uh, alternative names are: is um, is it time to abandon thermodynamic theory? Uh, is it um, uh, is protein? Um, uh, gives free energy change during folding, positive or negative number, and so on. Uh, you know, everyone knows, um, this is just for uh, reference that um, in order to uh, work properly, all proteins need to be in their native functional conformation, and they start their life as, as a polypeptide with no structure, and somehow they end up in this very specific three-dimensional structure. And why is it important for us to understand how it happens? Uh, there are obvious things. We want to be able to predict 3D protein structure from amino acid sequence. We want to predict uh, intermediate conformations that lead to native structure. And, um, one of the reasons for for importance of, of uh, intermediate points, uh, if we want to control protein folding process in silica, in vitro, in vivo, intervene in the pathological misfolding process, 
we need to know how it's happening. And finally, there is this um, area of um, artificial sequences. Uh, and um, although we are very good at creating artificial proteins that are very stable thermodynamically, um, <laughs> beautiful, but um, one class of, of proteins um, is actually very hard to, to, to make artificially. Um, enzymes are not, artificial enzymes are not working properly. And we um, will talk about it later, why it's hap happening. And um, the, the current progress of our um, understanding of folding is, is um, the following. We have uh, 500 million sequences in an ARP database and only about 200 um, I, um, experimentally sold, sold structures are available. And um, as a person who worked at the uh, high throughput crystallography company, I, I know why, why it is so. It's, it's a huge amount of work. It's very expensive. And um, we will never be able to do 500 millions in the lab. So we need to, to learn the structures by alternative ways. And there is a great progress made by predicting structures. Uh, everyone knows about alpha fold, um, how wonderful it is. And alpha fold generated 200 million structures recently and um, everyone is excited. But there are some voices that say, oh, but it's not always working. <laughs> It, it, it's good predicting structure, some structures, but it's not good predicting other structures. And um, anyone, who, again, who works with real proteins knows why it is so. And um, there is an area where people do not uh, quite understand that um, to have a final structure is not the same as understanding how the, the folding pathway um, um, was was um, being followed. What 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 were the intermediate products? Alpha fold does not tell us um, how how those proteins folded. Alpha fold relies on um, homology, um, covariation modeling. Alpha fold is not recapitulating the folding pathways. So if there is misfolding, alpha fold cannot tell us. Uh, why and where, at what point, or how to intervene. So there is, um, if uh, there are molecular dynamics pro pro programs where um, you can put a protein into virtual um, uh, vial and and observe what it does and hope that it will fold. And uh, only very very small percentage of proteins actually fold in the virtual vial. And again, I know that. That is what you would expect, because if they don't fold in real vial, they will never fold in artificial vial or in, in silica vial. Um, those are proteins that do not fold by themselves. That is the, the um, uh, impression that anyone who, who works with real proteins knows too well. But what is the reason for this failure to... to recapitulate the folding pathways in, 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 in silica. What, what, why we're not, uh, why uh, in, in, in vitro, in, 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 in a lab, you can always say, oh, you didn't create right conditions, or you didn't have chaperones, or you didn't, um, you know, basically your buffers are wrong pH. Although, uh, when we did um, high throughput um, folding, you you can do 96 well plates with various buffers and salts and, um, and, and additional chemicals and, and screen all of them for the best possible conditions for folding. Um, in silica, it should be possible to do even better, but they don't fold in silica. We cannot, we cannot um, recapitulate the folding pathways. And um, I think the reason for that is that we rely too much on, on the um, thermodynamic theory of protein folding. And it became dogma, and it's actually now hurting our efforts. 
So just to remind that what is thermodynamic theory of uh, uh, protein folding? Um, it's um, basically uh, was born and was based on um, works on a brilliant scientist, Christian Anfinsen, who showed that RNAs A will fold spontaneously into native conformation after he denatured it to um, com com completion. <laughs> and um, after restoration of favorable conditions, RNAs spring back and became an active um, enzyme again. The thermodynamic hypothesis um, that was born is the three-dimensional structure of a native protein in its normal physiological milieu is one which um, um, has the free <clears throat> at, at where the free energy of the whole of the whole system is the lowest, and the main points of of this theory um, uh, that the folding happened from completely denatured state spontaneously and into the state of global minimum of Gibbs free energy. Um, we um, see that from this work, um, the whole I don't even know how to describe it. Um, hundreds and hundreds of works where people are um, uh, studying the energy landscapes uh, of, of the folding proteins. And um, most of them um, would, would um, you probably saw, saw them, um, they, they teach children at school, <laughs> at school now and certainly students that um, the folding landscape most likely looks like a funnel. And um, the reason this funnel uh, shape was born is that uh, if you look at the uh, pr protein, just um, regular average size protein, you probably heard about um, Leventhal paradox that um, it has um, 10 to the power of 300 number of different conformations. And those conformations, if, if the protein were to sample all of them, um, it will take longer time than the age of the universe. So then protein must be following some um, pathway of folding, not, not sampling all conformations. And this pathway or this process is, um, so, so if you can imagine this um, blue area extending forever, that would be the different um, conformations with approximately same Gibbs free energy. And once, it's, once it starts folding, it folds and uh, falls into this um, uh, funnel shaped landscape until it finds the, um, the um, native conformation at the bottom. And um, of course, um, Gibbs free energy here is higher than here and delta G of folding is negative number. And um, so this drop in free energy is the um, driving force behind this process. And um, of course, Leventhal himself, he said, oh, if we cannot sample all of those confirmations, then there is a pathway. If there is a pathway, it does not necessarily lead to the um, global minimum of, of folding. Maybe the protein goes somewhere here and stays there protected by kinetic barrier, and it's a metastable molecule. But even Leventhal, um, he still um, was, was thinking in terms of protein falling somewhere in this area spontaneously. And um, uh, from this simple um, ragged um, funnel, uh, all kinds of be beautiful artwork was created. You can see here again, um, some proteins um, um, fall into smooth um, um, funnel, some follow more rugged funnels. Um, and uh, all these landscapes, they might be helpful, but it's, it's, all, uh, it's all our imagination. Here is another one that's shaped as volcano. The protein has to climb up this hill for a while. Um, 
uh, and I, I lost my pointer somehow. I don't know whether you see it or not. Um, so the, the protein uh, climbs up the hill because of the drop in, um, in entropy, and um, which raises the Gibbs free energy, and then finally falls into, onto the bottom of the, of, of the um, funnel. And again, even if it, if, if it climbs up, and I don't know what's the driving force in this paper, um, it still falls uh, to the native conformation that's lower than denatured state. And finally, um, here you see <laughs> the mother of all funnels that uh, tries to, to illustrate all possible scenarios, misfolded proteins, partially folded states, chaperones, helping proteins um, overcome those kinetic barriers and um, leading them into the proper uh, native conformation and so on. So, and, and I, I wanted to, to notice, uh, point again that unfolded proteins are on top. I don't know, I'm, I don't see my pointer again. So the unfolded proteins are somewhere on, here on top and all the pro, uh, folded ones here on the bottom. So um, they're thermodynamically stable molecules. And um, this is the um, uh, graph from, uh, from a very sophisticated paper from PNAS uh, that um, the paper was, um, um, looking at distribution of protein stabilities. There is a database called Proterm. Um, it, it had, um, at the time of the publishing of this paper, it had about 30,000 um, entries um, with um, delta G of folding of various proteins. And um, it, it was striking to see that this graph was actually based on data for only 750 or, or less than a thousand proteins out of those 35,000. And we looked at it close at some point and I'll show you the data. But um, uh, all this is theoretical biophysical work is wonderful, but um, there is a, uh, one observation that um, anyone who works with, with real proteins makes that it, all this theory never ever helps you in real lab. You, you never can ask biophysicists, what, so what conditions should I use to, to, to have a successful folding? Because what we see is many proteins cannot fold and we do not publish that data. We do not study failures. Why, why, why did they not fail? And uh, believe me, um, it happens more often than not. So um, it looks, the situation looks a little bit like this. Um, there is theory and there is practice and um, there is not enough communication. Um, what we know from empirical data is uh, proteins are incredibly diverse. Some proteins retain their native structures for years. Others have uh, live um, just minutes. In vitro, some proteins you can, the, actually the method for purification is you boil the um, lysate or you, you know, hom homogenized, um, I don't know, plant um, material, you boil this homogenate and um, all proteins uh, denature and fall to the bottom precipitate and your target protein is still folded properly and, and in the supernatant and you just spin it down. And um, this is wonderful first step of purification. Um, this is how um, stable they are. They withstand boiling temperatures. And of course we have um, organisms that live at very high temperatures. And other proteins need to be refrigerated at all times. And um, what is was happening all these years, the classic models of folding, they are based on studies of um, only subset of proteins. 
um, small stable proteins uh, are easy to work and with and they were studied um, as as a model <laughs> proteins RNA is a the protein that um, uh, Dr. Hinson was working with is notoriously stable. This is the um, insert that you get when you buy this protein. Um, they advise you to boil it so that all DNA's activity is removed and only RNA's A activity is left. So RNA's A is perfectly fine after boiling. And um, if you um, have access to thousands of proteins, you would not be as, as um, cavalier as uh, you are if you work with RNAs A all your life. You would um, spend more time <laughs> refrigerating and taking care of your proteins. And there is always a misconception that, oh, um, every biochemistry department has cold room. And um, People, people work in cold rooms to preserve activity of their proteins. And um, misconception is, oh, they do it so that the proteins get no, will not be um, eaten up by proteolysis. Or oh, the proteases is what you are actually um, prote protecting from in the cold rooms. But there are protease inhibitors and they're very, you know, could be used successfully. There is no reason to be in a cold room um, to, other than the fact that some proteins spontaneously unfold at room temperature. And um, considerable huge resources are spent by pharmaceutical and biotechnology industries in attempts to keep those purified proteins from unfolding. And um, what, isn't it a little bit strange that um, we theoretically say that these are thermodynamically stable proteins, they should be folding at physiological conditions and they are unfolding in, in our hands and they're unfolding actually in vivo as well. And um, you can always say, oh, you, it's a hostile conditions. Your, your buffers are all wrong. But the common <laughs> sense tells you, by now we should be able to recreate physiological conditions. There is nothing magical about physiological conditions. Um, and physiological conditions is not even room temperature, but 37 degrees. They should be fine at 37 degrees. Why at 24 they are unfolding? Why do we need to go to cold room? And um, here is an illustration. Um, there are more papers <laughs> that are uh, talking about protein stability than uh, papers on protein folding. Um, so uh, what we know, again, from the lab, um, refolding of denatured proteins is, is a very slow and efficient process. It takes days, the yield is very low, a lot of protein is lost because they follow the wrong pathway. And um, the majority of proteins actually, once denatured completely, actually do not refold. Um, I heard a, a case um, very striking case when uh, at Human Genome Sciences, we developed a very good protocol for refolding uh, uh, after guanidine um, ex extraction, after uh, inclusion bodies um, were dissolved and purified and uh, refold was, was, was successful. And um, the protein was given uh, into the hands and the protocol was given uh, to the production factory people. And um, after <laughs> um, a short time, they came back uh, saying, oh, your protocol doesn't work. The protein, this protein does not fold as you described. And um, a colleague of mine went to the factory, to the production facility. And um, the reason she found that they uh, actually changed one, adjusted a little bit one step in the protocol. They increased guanidine concentration. So they wanted to extract more from, from the 
kilograms of inclusion bodies. And once they increased guanidine concentration, um, the extracted protein stopped refolding. And we discussed it. And the year was 1995 or 96. So we discussed it with, with um, my colleague. And we only concluded that in order to refold, that protein needed some residual structure. Inclusion bodies are not just jumbled, un unfolded, or uh, aggregated mass. Inclusion bodies, as um, later there are, were a lot of papers um, describing it, is inclusion bodies are partially folded proteins that form amyloid-like um, structure. They, they stick to each other, but once when they were produced in bacteria, they partially folded uh, on ribosomes of bacteria. And um, once you extract it from guanidine, if you are careful, you, you don't have to, to use the highest guanidine concentration. Um, in fact, the milder the uh, denaturing conditions, the better your um, success of refolding. So if there is some residual structure, it helps to refold. And if you refold, unfold completely, then there is no refolding. <laughs> it, it, it makes you think all those uh, papers describing successful uh, refolding, how far did they unfold? All those papers where the um, uh, delta G of folding was measured and in order to measure it, you have to unfold and fold back, unfold and fold back, preferably several times. Um, how far do they unfold? Do they unfold it completely? Because if, if you unfold it completely, maybe it would not fold back. Um, the, the only way to tell is to um, perform um, sophisticated uh, monitoring by NMR or, or something like this, because even um, CD or activity um, uh, monitoring, it doesn't give you anything. You can lose activity, but still have partial structure. And what is the reason for um, failure of to refold? Um, there, there could be many. Maybe the proteins are aggregating, or maybe they oxidized, or there is other chemical degradation. And um, now it's not it's not uh, fashionable, but as uh, <laughs> um, late as <laughs> early as 1988, people were still interested in um, uh, interfering with folding. So here is the paper uh, from um, uh, colleague. Uh, who actually went to the same department in Moscow, uh, Dr. Klebanov, uh, they were st studying irreversible uh, denaturation. And they show that um, uh, there is reversible denaturation and there is irreversible denaturation. And um, the, the way that irreversible denaturation start, uh, uh, happens, they were here specifically looking at what is what is happening um, and they found that irreversible denaturation in this case it was thermal in, in, in activation it happens very fast much faster than oxidation first you unfold the protein so that it no longer can fold and then it it gets oxidized and then it gets uh, aggregating aggregation is a slow process but irreversible inactivation is a fast process. You unfold it completely, and it, it's now in the confirmation that it cannot uh, recover from. From this particular completely unfolded state, this particular protein cannot fold back. So, um, and um, now knowing all of this, um, it's actually very difficult to measure delta G of folding. So in order to measure delta G of folding, you have to be sure that you unfold it completely and your protein really folded back. And um, unfolding completely could be a, a, a challenge. I talked to, to many people who do this um, NMR studies of residual uh, structures. Sometimes they heat it, they boil it, they add one molar 
um, acid, like a hydrochloric acid, and the protein still has some structure left. Um, look at this persistent of native like topology and denatured protein in eight molar urea. So it's um, now going back to, to, the, to this paper, um, this um, proterm database that supposedly has uh, delta G of folding of thousands and thousands of proteins. So we looked at, at, um, at this data. Uh, my, actually, my youngest daughter created Juniper books for me, and we, we did sorting and filtering. And a lot of times, um, the papers that uh, the data came from, they were just studying mutants and um, their thermal stability. And it's not uh, it's thermodynamic stability and thermal stability is different things. Um, the protein could be denaturing, but it doesn't mean that it will renature. And um, we excluded all the uh, mutants. And um, um, in the end, uh, there were only 650 unique proteins from all kingdoms, from plant, animals, fungi, <laughs> from everything. Just 16, 650 unique proteins are in that database. And then we looked at what at, at those papers <laughs> and, and what is what um, how did they measure the, the delta G of folding? And there were reversible denaturation recorded only for 320. So only 320 were unfolded and then folded back. And out of 320, less than 10 monitored the unfolding by NMR. So only 10, you can say, yes, they really unfolded them. And of course, we can add to this number. Um, I talked to the lab that does chemical synthesis. Um, they had, I don't know, 60 proteins that they synthesized by chemical means. Uh, amino acids are added one by one, and um, there were no native structure present, and um, they folded. Those are small proteins again. No one does large ones. So uh, if we look at this graph now, uh, and um, if we know uh, how those data were obtained, um, I would think that maybe we should consider the possibility that some proteins, the ones that have delta G of folding, uh, as a positive number, um, you cannot measure it. You unfold them and they know, do not fold back. So maybe this graph should look like this. Uh, and we should be honest, for 500 million proteins, we do not have the data. No one measured delta G of folding. We don't know. So if we don't know, and I, I keep interviewing scientists and I ask, what, what do you think delta G of folding is? And more than once I've heard um, honest answers. I do not know. And this is the only answer we should be, <laughs> we should be um, uh, giving. We do not know delta G of folding. So not really known. And let's consider the possibility that the proteins are metastable, that they occupy um, some of them, um, like on this um, graph. Some of them has um, negative delta G of folding, some of them have positive, and some of them somewhere near zero. It doesn't matter. They can still exist as metastable molecules. They can be protected by, and again, I don't see my, my pointer, unfortunately. So and they can be protected by this barrier, um, uh, kinetic barrier, um, live for a while and eventually succumb to some um, adverse uh, events and fall back into stable state uh, down at the bottom uh, into a denatured state. And um, if you see uh, the world, um, like I see it when uh, at equilibrium, when we are all dead, majority of our proteins are unfolded and they're not folding back. So why, um, why this view is not popular? 
I mean, there is nothing, nothing wrong with this view of protein world. Proteins behave as metastable molecules. Why we're not looking at it? And the answer is because if we uh, say that it's possible that some proteins or majority, or I don't even know what percentage, uh, um, they're so diverse and we, we hope we have no data. Why do we say so rarely or never consider the possibility? And the answer is because then we would have to say how, how do we fold, what is folding them? No one ever saw folding machine in themselves. There is no, there is no little Santa Claus helpers uh, folding proteins. So this question how is what prevents us even um, considering this possibility. So, uh, in order to fold them, they need some kind of energy dependent process um, that actually um, spends energy <laughs> on folding. And the physical uh, model uh, based on this assumption is um, actually not, not a fantasy model. Our um, living cell is an open system that's not at equilibrium and it has access to energy sources, so it should be possible. And um, I was thinking, okay, <laughs> let's be brave and think <laughs> that it's happening. How can we do it? And um, it took me a while. I was trying to imagine all kinds of um, um, things that the cell could be doing to protein to help it fold. And this is what um, uh, came to my mind. So if we fix one end of polypeptide chain and rotate another end, we, we make it um, occupy some kind of strain conformation um, like this. Um, this, is, <laughs> this is a toy model, but still. Look how I unfold it and folds back. I fold it and folds back. Unfold, folds back. The residual structure helps it fold back. But if I unfold it completely, it will never come to this confirmation. So um, my um, dear husband was a person who encouraged me and he said, oh, you should really pursue it. It's a really good idea. And I was reluctant. I said, well, I'll make a fool of myself. It's, it's, it's a silly idea. And he said, no, it's too important. If you are wrong, it's okay. You, you have to, you have to, to, to study um, whether anything like this happens in the cell. And um, he actually was the one who went and read thousands and thousands of papers. And he came back and said, um, we, um, we should consider uh, the ribosome actually does have um, uh, rotation movements in peptidyl transferase center. And now we're learning maybe along the, uh, the ribosomal channel, um, there are some residues pushing the uh, nascent peptide. And of course, once it comes out of ribosome, there is this host of um, chaperones at the entrance in bacteria, it's trigger factor, and um, in eukaryotes, it's um, welcoming committee chaperones. And look, it, it even looks <laughs> like a like, uh, toy model that I just um, shown you. And um, if you look at some numbers, they look wonderful too. The marginal stability of native protein is, is look how, how small it is. The, the, um, it's 515 kilocalories per mole of protein, the whole protein. And uh, same amount is used by ribosome each time when um, uh, peptide, peptide bond is, is formed. For every cycle, um, it uses 15 kilocalories um, because um, all the GTP that's being hydrolyzed, it, it's used for something that we don't know what for. The, the amino acids come to, to peptidyl transferase center already activated. So no energy is needed for peptide bond formation. Um, so all this GTP that ribosome spends 
it spins on some kind of magical movements. Um, why not on pushing the peptide um, into uh, right conformations? Um, look, 3000 kilocalories per, per uh, small protein um, is used mysteriously. And of course, this is peptidyl transferase center uh, where there is this swing and some kind of movement. And um, we'll discuss it a little bit later in what direction peptide is being pushed. That's a mystery now. Um, uh, the, another paper, it's, these are random papers. They just show what, what was exciting to us. The shape of bacterial ribosome exit tunnel affects co-translational protein folding. No doubt, it should affect the folding. The geometry of ribosomal polypeptide exit tunnel is, is being studied. Why we're not um, taking it in consideration? Um, uh, trigger factor. And here, um, uh, this is just a note, how people st studying trigger factor still think that its role is anti-aggregation. No, its role probably is much more interesting. It's not just protecting nascent chain from, from aggregation. It, it actually um, helps it to fold. Irina, you so, have about two minutes. Yes, I'm finishing. Okay. Yes, um, and I'm sorry. Uh, so um, uh, I was trying to con <laughs> convince anyone who would listen about um, this um, little string thing and um, um, the main the main argument against um, this that I heard was that um, peptide is is not is not a string and of course we know that it it's a um, freely jointed chain so if you fix one end and you rotate another end nothing would happen and I was thinking no it it, it cannot be true because look at the um, Ramachandran plots. Um, there is um, sterical hindrances. Once you start rotating, those sterical hindrances would help you achieve the right uh, effect. And this is the, finally, a uh, young student from Armenia, Arutun Sakyan, um, actually did what I was asking for. And this is the uh, almost end of my presentation where I show how um, the protein folding machine prototype is working. And uh, there are three peptides here. Uh, all It's the same peptide in three conditions. Um, the one end is, is fixed. Another end is rotated in one direction, in another direction, and control, um, there is no rotation applied. And you can see that in this competition, the one that's being rotated in the right direction it quickly attains alpha helical structure. The one that is, is um, rotated in the wrong direction will never attain um, its helical structure. And the control uh, peptide will eventually fold into helix, but it will take 10 times more, 20 times more, depending on, on peptide. Um, and some might never do it. So as you can see, the winner on top is already folded and the other two are not. And we proceeded to do it with larger proteins. This is the beta-beta-alpha uh, BBA design protein. And here we did transient rotation. We uh, rotated for the first 250 nanoseconds of uh, simulation. And these are all atom uh, molecular dynamic simulations. If this is the... Uh, the model that everyone um, is using for folding. And again, the transient rotation uh, helps. Um, the upper um, version uh, of, of uh, the protein is uh, folding now. The, there is alpha helix. It will take it a while to fold um, the beta um, in, into place, but um, it only takes one minute. So here we go. The, the 
the one that we helped by um, twisting a little bit is already folded. And the control simulation, uh, now uh, where no rotation applied, um, we, we will uh, speed up it so it, it doesn't it, it never it doesn't fold basically. So uh, knowing this, knowing that um, at right conditions with a little twist, we can affect the, the folding trajectory. Uh, we can say now, oh, it's possible. It's it maybe on ribosome, maybe some, somewhere um, you can apply forces just right, and you can help protein fold. And if it's so, then uh, both scenarios are possible. You can see here the funnel, um, the classical funnel, or funnel on top of the mountain. And upper two pictures are um, isolated protein in native conformation. This is how the folding landscape would look like. The one on the left is very stable. The one on the right is metastable. Eventually, it will um, it will um, denature. Uh, how fast depends on how deep that, that um, um, depression is or how high the kinetic barriers are. Uh, same proteins, uh, when they're in living cells, the pictures on the bottom, um, the folding landscape is affected by all the interactions with, with um, other proteins. It's completely different from for the same protein. And um, Again, it's it's only art, but it actually um, describes empirical data better than what we have now. And how do we get into the top of the mountain? This is the um, folding energy lands landscape as it happens uh, for small protein, thermodynamically stable, or for larger protein, it look, probably looks like this. It's a... Uh, um, depression, but it's on the top of the mountain. And from there, there is only way down. The denaturation is irreversible. And again, it, um, it actually feeds empirical data so much better. Uh, position A on this um, landscape is our native conformation. B and C are reversible denaturation. And um, various folding uh, unfolding pathways um, they, they um, actually match empirical data that shows the hydral angle distribution is different if you use thermal denaturation or guanidine denaturation or different types of denaturation or single molecule um, stretching. <laughs> different types of denaturation give you different unfolding um, pathways. The distribution of angles is different. It's being measured and uh, um, folding pathway could be a single pathway as shown here. It could be two alternative ones or many more depending on conditions. But um, this, this picture actually feeds empirical data much better. And now to conclude, uh, we should, if, if anything you, uh, that I want, <laughs> I want you to remember from this talk, the experimental data supporting equilibrium folding mo models are too scant. The negative delta G of folding has been measured reliably for less than 100 proteins. This, this is all we have. This, this is the giant field is, 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 is being held by few RNAs, barnes, <laughs> and um, few small proteins that everyone was studying. And um, empirical observations that the majority of proteins are unable to fold in vitro should cue us not to expect in silica folding. The lacks of, of progress is not due to modeling, uh, uh, lack of computational power that is often um, explained by. It's due to modeling of unrealistic process. The solution is to postulate that in vivo folding happens differently. There is folding machine, it's energy dependent, and this is how we should um, build our new physical model. And um, if it's a non-equilibrium <laughs> energy dependent process, the folding machine applies forces to the backbone. Um, it does, the folding does not start from completely unstructured protein. We should not model that. We should um, 
try to 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 um, impose restrictions as they imposed on on the ribosome. Um, global the 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 folding does not end in global thermodynamic minimum. It might uh, there might be <laughs> there might be proteins, small proteins that are indeed in in, in the final resting position, but we don't have to to to, to model it this way. We um, and this is the list of papers. And uh, please remember, this is the last uh, thing that um, I wanted to emphasize. Protein backbone does not always behave as freely jointed chain. You just saw the, the um, movies. And um, this is uh, the result that no one believed that it's possible. Everyone would say, oh, you, you, you rotate one end, nothing happens. It's like, um, is if it's freely jointed chain, it's like a string of beads. <laughs> you, you rotate one bead, nothing happens to the chain. But sterical hindrances create this uh, effect. Uh, rotation uh, in one end of the backbone creates the propagation along the backbone. This is our main experimental achievement. And these are all the people who supported me and who encouraged and said, oh, it's interesting, you should, you should be doing it. And um, the, the um, person who, um, here is uh, Dr. Kunia and my husband at the uh, meeting. And um, this is, uh, again, my husband and the person who actually believed enough in the idea and uh, spent his time uh, modeling and fixing one end and rotating another end is Harutun Saakyan, and he used to be a student at Yerevan University at the time, and now he's working at, as postdoc at NIH, at NCBI, and this is another group of people who helped me a lot, and um, thank you so much for the, um, for your Attention and sorry if I was too long. So, um, thank you very, very much, Irina. Unfortunately, we can't uh, all show you clapping. Yeah, because uh, that's a this that's a problem with uh, Zoom meetings. Mm -hmm. um, so let's open this up for questions. Are there questions? Yes, so um, Irina, did we overlap at uh, SGX Pharmaceuticals, Structural Genomics? Uh, it, I'm not sure. When, I went, when did you leave? I left, um, the, the, I worked there the, the year that they um, uh, were organized, and I, I left uh, a year later. I worked for a year. So you probably left before I became CSO there at the beginning of 2022, 2002, sorry. 20 years ago. Yeah. Way, way earlier, way earlier. Yeah. 90, I would say uh, I, I started 98, left 99. Mm -hmm. So the one yeah. that. And you had we worked with the CEO, Tim Harris at Sequana, I am assuming. Yes, yeah. Tim. Okay. Okay. Right. okay. I've, I've connected all the dots then. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to. Um, uh, ask you to amplify on your point that. Um, alpha fold two or Rosetta fold mm -hmm. do not are not actually studying the protein folding problem. They're, mm -hmm. they're not solutions to the protein folding problem. They they study the fine they in in a way they contribute to folding. We we do need um, if we want to 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 um, recapitulate the folding as it happens. We do need um, any help any cheat sheets, any information about final result uh, or final uh, structure. So if they are accurate, that is wonderful. But if you are not accurate, then it's actually hindering the progress. And it depends on the protein you are studying. And unfortunately, uh, how would you know? <laughs> how yep. would you know whether- Well, I think I think the, um, the PLDDT, oh, Paul, you've been able to, to find your screen control. I think the PLDDT, um, measure of, of 
prediction confidence is is reasonable works reasonably well in many cases, but it's not not perfect. And we we published a paper recently showing uh, discrepancies. Um, and and the softer the protein, uh, 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 some uh, and proteins are different. Some some have more defined structure, and some are very. Um, I don't know, um, the elastic, the uh, enzymes they need to use, intrinsically disordered proteins, they, they are moving, they, and the, the, the less um, rigid the structure, the worse is the prediction that um, alpha fold. Yeah. Can... So you mentioned briefly the possibility that the ribosome might be sort of nudging the, um, the nascent polypeptide chain into the right conformation. Um, do you have any thoughts about uh, how GROWEL, GROWES would be contributing? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a, oh, thank you for asking. Yeah, so, have chaperones. Oh, yes, yeah. GROWEL is, is a wonderful molecule. I just enjoy looking at how it works. There are also movies. You have this huge uh, barrel and then it squeezes the protein. And um, the... The, the conventional, the common view on GROEL is, oh, it creates sanctuary. The protein, um, you know, uh, floats inside and then protected from aggregation, for protected from everything, it can fall there. But if you, if you, if you think of, of, of how proteins often um, being de uh, denatured, it's water. Water gets into little crevices, and the water makes um, the protein molecule um, expand. And proter, water helps uh, denaturation. And I'm I'm thinking, why don't we look at the squeezing of protein? Maybe it's uh, it it floats into GROEL, and this motion that we see is actually helping uh, to push water out of those crevices. That's my, that's my, and of course it's fantasy. I'm, I'm not a specialist in Gruel. And again, the chaperone field is so enormous and large that um, now we, we, I actually um, hope that there will be support from that community because a lot of chaperones are ATP aces. They do something actively. Mm -hmm. so they, they, uh, they have to, they have to finally, um, find how how they are manipulating the chain. It, I, I have no doubt that um, some, at least some of them do, but um, it maybe it's too early. <laughs> maybe it's, it, it's, it's any biochemical work, any person who works with proteins uh, knows how it's a tedious, difficult work. And that's why I'm um, trying to convince biophysicists that they should be digging the tunnel from the other end towards us. They should be um, trying to model various scenarios, not, not just enjoy the usual uh, funnel shift <laughs> studies, but try to try to match the diversity of, of proteins. Try, try to, um, to see um, you can model various scenarios how chaperones might work. That GROEL might be actually squeezing water out of water. Yeah. Wall. yeah, it's hard to know what's happening inside that cage. Paul, did you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, thank you. I mean, I know John Ellis and I, you know, knew him pretty well. So, I mean, when he discovered uh, many of the GROEL and chaperones, uh, he also was very puzzled at how it works. But I, I want to make a, 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 I have a question. So, um, you know, we uh, at Rutgers, I'm in the marine sciences program as well. And um, we work a lot on deep sea hydrothermal vents. Mm -hmm. And um, there are organisms that can live very close to a hydrothermal vent, mm -hmm. which the temperature is on order of uh, 100 degrees centigrade. Mm -hmm. But we haven't crystallized proteins from those organisms. Oh, well, we have, we have. There are a number of uh, of uh, of these. Um, yeah, there, there are a number some, of proteins. But yeah, I mean, it's not but clear the, the, what makes them stable. That that's right, and and the, you know the the early hypotheses. Oh, there are extra salt bridges, etc. All of those prove to be false. Pro -pro false, right? Yeah, yeah, and and it's completely it's completely obscure 
when you compare the structures of the mesophile um, versus the thermophile um, uh, ortholog homologs and orthologs, it's completely unclear as to wh why uh, well, one protein is is hyperstable at uh, high pressure, high temperature. It's okay. it's actually um, if if I may, um, uh, I, this this is one of my areas. Of yeah, well, I'm afraid I'm sorry, Irina. We should continue this. Um, uh, we should continue this discussion with the graduate students and allow the, uh, the the regular meeting participants to the seminar participants to step away just to be respectful of their time. You were provided, you were both, uh, Irina and Paul were provided with um, um, separate um, Zoom links to uh, to be able to join the students. So could you go to those? Uh, could we disengage from this meeting and, and engage in the other Zoom, please? Okay. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Great thank talk. You so Re I really, really enjoyed it. Yeah. And I'm going to continue. Uh, I look forward to continuing the conversation in a few minutes.